So welcome, and uh, we are going to talk about some 2020 stuff. And since 2021 is shaping up a whole lot like 2020, I'm trying to be safe because I have not seen you since pre-pandemic, so I just have some questions for you. <laughs> so in the last four to six weeks, have you had a fever, flu-like symptoms, anything like that? Nice. I have not. You know, it's funny, I, I, I'm an essential worker, so I actually answer these questions every day. Oh, okay. In the last four to six weeks, have you licked any stripper poles or any, you know, bar table tops? Uh, stripper poles and all, no, but bar table tops, unfortunately, yes. Okay. Um, what about in the last 18 months, have you tweeted anything positive about Joss Wheat? <laughs> unfortunately, before stuff came out, I did a diatribe about how Avengers is probably better than Star Wars New Hope. Okay, well, at least that's about the movie, not him. <laughs> this is the important one. In the last four to six weeks, have you or anyone you've come in contact with watched a Steven Seagal movie? Sadly, no. Okay, uh, we're I'm good. <laughs> I don't know how much of the, the Van Damocalypse stuff you watched when I was doing those, but I, I was really enjoying trashing Seagal a lot. The Time Cop one was the one that I watched. Okay. Because that might be my favorite Van Damme movie. Time Cop's awesome. It, yeah. It In is. fact, I recorded the intro here when I was talking to myself. That was here. Nice. Yeah. Um, you were me and I was, I was also me. I remember watching that and being like, man, Hawk Lake... He does real stuff. Double Impact had yeah. worse twins than that. Gonzi was like, you, you think that like Van Damme would watch this and be like, son of a... Like, how easy is it now to do this? Talking about... We were talking about uh, 90s movies being homophobic. The other guy would probably say some stuff about that. That's true. So, like I said, we're going to be talking 2020. Yeah. And this is um, a co-production between Hawk Schlock and uh, your... And drop podcast. Yeah, called, yeah. It's called Drop the Deuce, right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, or, real quick, both of us. That doesn't used, sound right. Actually, we uh, we we left the throes of, of Manny Funkowitz and the now defunct Portimus. Yes. And, for for those who don't know, uh, Ben C and I used to write for the same website years ago. Now. Yeah, I was thinking about it in the car over here. Uh, I think it's been like ten years. That, is that when we started that? I think it's like 2011. Yeah, I think so. Good lord, man! Because it was right before I moved here that we ended it, and at the end there, I think it was just me and you posting. <laughs> Pro probably. When I was looking at it, you have the honor of having the top two posts. One about Dylan and something. You wrote a bunch of pieces about Dylan. So I did, yeah. I couldn't tell you which one it was. I wrote a lot of music stuff back then. Well, that was what you, yeah. you wrote the music yeah. articles, and I wrote the movie yeah. stuff, and then all of us would kind of write movie stuff. But your second one was this whole thing, which, I mean, I'm, I'm not that big on it, was about Kurt Cobain dying and the conspiracy behind it. Oh, yeah, because I, re I read a book on that. Yeah, yeah, I think it was a review of that book. We had quite a wide uh, audience there at, at the at the mouse. And I don't. I think we probably took all of those with us to your uh, now tens of tens of years. I got I got dozens of them. I'm I'm. Is that called viral? I, I, I think so. And we're doing okay. We uh. I'm steady around 600 subscribers. Cool, man. Uh, on Drop the Dice, so those of you out there who yeah, so, uh, yeah, I was kidding about Drop the Deuce. It's, it's that my my secretary's a three year old, so she wrote that down wrong. Uh, to to be fair, I, I do talk about board games usually, so this is going to be yeah. a pleasure. Um, getting to one of my other vices, talking about films here from 2020. Uh, so before we get into it, we're talking about our top ten. Dude, let's talk about like just movie going in 2020. I know you had a much did, more interesting. Did, did you know this? 2020 was weird. <laughs> Um, so unprecedented as you know, so. going into 2020 it probably seemed like well this would be a pretty good year we're gonna get new Bond we're gonna get new Nolan we're gonna get a new Fincher we're gonna you know all these things we're gonna be getting that you know movie people look forward to Nolan, Nolan and Wonder Woman is kind of the extent of the blockbusters I, I mean Bad Boys 3 came out in like March I guess. Oh, did it really yeah was that last year yeah holy shit because I remember at a certain point people were like this is gonna be the highest and I think it might still be the highest grossing movie worldwide for for 2020 was at one point bad boys for life you kept going to, to movies which we'll get to in a second i was gonna tell you this before but the last movie i saw in the theater harley quinn the birds of prey yeah and you probably had a great time right i did i actually love the movie i think yeah, it's great to be fair i have it on 4k I have not watched it yet it's a lot of fun but, you know. um i don't know how much i care about people going like this is the dc's answer to deadpool well, just because she swears and, like, uh, talks to the camera? I, I don't know, like... Is this DC's version of Ferris Bueller? They, yeah. You could say that, if that's all it is. But it's it's a lot of fun. I guess the girl power thing's there, but they're all got a bunch of badass chicks. Like, it's really cool. And, and do you like it better than Suicide Squad? Absolutely. When, when do we get the A or cut? I was really actually excited. Recently, um, Riley has come around. He used to love Suicide Squad because of Will Smith. Okay. And we've been watching a lot more movies lately, and he's like, Dad... 
I think Suicide Squad's a bad movie, isn't it? And it's like, yes, my son. Yes, How old is he now? He's 12. Which is also crazy because when I met you, he was Mom. in Mom's Belly still. Yeah, we, oh, that's I, right, yeah. When I came out to Hollywood. And that's right, when we guys. saw The Happening. <laughs> yeah. M. Night Shyamalan's masterpiece. Of, Which uh, still, like, I feel like tries to get a cult following every now and then. Yeah, yeah. I, I rewatched it a few months ago, actually, for the first time in years. And... Still no? There's that scene where freaking, uh, what's his name? Marky Mark is talking to a plant. There's that? And he's like, you know. And then he, but he even says, like, I'm talking to a plant. There's yeah. the other one where the lady's like, you're trying to kill me. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. no. Well, like that, like... That awkward kind of dialogue is in all of Shyamalan stuff. Like, it's in Signs. Is there's, it? There's awkward dialogue, but when you have Joaquin and Mel Gibson, yeah. they make it work. It's hard to make this the, the line, swing away, work. Like, Joker like, can do it. You know, not, everyone, <laughs> not everyone can do it. Uh, but I feel like we might have digressed a little bit. Yeah, we, we did. Like, Harley Quinn's Harley Quinn. Margot Robbie's not she, bad. She, she's she's a solid actress. All things with Suicide Squad aside, you have to at least say she's good in it. Like, she's yeah. good casting. Like, Wonder Woman 1984... Yeah. At the very least, Gal Gadot is yeah, she's Wonder Woman. Is great casting. I mean, that's yeah. like Jackman level. I was gonna say like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, but that was perfect. mine. You kept going. My last one before quarantine was Billy Madison because I hosted it, and I was like, if this is what I go on, this is my legacy. <laughs> it's Adam Sandler from the '90s. It's not gonna be good. And then the next time I went, technically, the first time I went out during that whole period was uh, I went to the drive-in to see, um, well, this movie right here. Uh, the first word's invisible, which is why you can't see it. The last one there. That's very clever. <laughs> and I ran out of ends as well, so it's invisible ma'am, which <laughs> I still think works. That um, is hilarious. So that I went out and saw that at the drive-in, which is probably not the best movie to see at the drive-in. It's a darker movie aesthetically and everything. Yeah. But I had a good time. Um, I've never gaslit or abused women, but I have been invisible to them, so it hit hard all the same. You liked it that much, so it would have been up there? I, I, I mean, no. Okay. The guy who directed it did um, Upgrade, right? He wrote he Saw. He wrote some of the Saws, right? That's he wrote the first Saw. Yeah. With, okay. with Wynn, right? Yeah. James Wynn. And then he might have wrote the next one, but he then he went and did Upgrade. He wrote and directed Upgrade, I think, and then he wrote and directed Invisible Man. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, which is pretty cool. Which, I, I, this could have been a big, huge budget trying to do a multiverse movie with Johnny right. Depp. It, was, was, it wasn't going to be with Johnny Depp, yeah. originally. So nothing against Johnny Depp. No matter what Amber Amber Heard, don't sue me. Yeah. Um, I'd rather have this. This is it's super cool. It's very it seems very modern. Yeah. Um, and you know, Hollow Man stars a girl named Elizabeth. This stars a girl named Elizabeth. I I think she's great in it. I love how much it pushes her to the to the brink. Like, the Chevy Chase one that's directed by John Carpenter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And totally didn't realize that. Man, yeah. Totally did not. And it's a total like. Like, hey, let's do North by Northwest, but with Chevy Chase as a guy who's invisible. Yeah. You know, I, I like... I did, too. I had no it's idea it was John movie, Carpenter. Dude, yeah. And then when Alamo opened back up in September, I guess it was, when they were allowed to open back up, and, you know, they did the whole... I don't know if you've looked into, like, the theater safe program, and I went and saw Bill and Ted 3. Yeah, which, according to this, it's going to rank pretty high. Well, I mean, this isn't a real ranking, obviously. Oh, I it's mean, not? Okay. No, no, no. There's a reason why New Milan... Or you know, New Mutants, I don't know which it's supposed to be, um, is up there. Bill and Ted 3 at one point was in the top 10. It, absolutely. Uh, I don't... I think that this year, more than any, when we look at my top 10, we always talk about favorite versus best. You, like you know, I'm a big proponent of that. This is definitely a more of a favorite list than yeah. a best list. And I think Bill and Ted 3 is just what we needed at the time. To, for that to be my first movie back, it was the right movie back. Oh, yeah. Like, it, um, I think we were getting over one of the first humps... We might have still been in lockdown or just after lockdown. Yeah, this was like this was like a little after lockdown. Things it, were still pretty quiet. And I think you know. people were still really, maybe more than anything, uncertain of what was going to happen. Yeah. And you just have this, like, shot of unbridled it's positivity. Just, it's just fun. Yeah. And to be in a theater again, like, first A, you never realize, I should say, how much you miss, no matter how much you think you miss them. Yeah. So you walk back in and you walk down that aisle you go get your seat. Yeah. Obviously, things are a little bit different as far as, you know, you're in your group that you go with, you know. But sure. then, like, even people I knew were, like, away. Oh, okay. Like, we didn't sit together, you know. And so that was a bit weird because yeah. we've all been in movies by ourselves before. That's not yeah. that weird. But it is weird when you know that it's, like, a well-sold screening in socially distanced times. But, like, because of that, nice. people are far away. And, like, just to be in that environment and hear people laughing 
Yeah. Because, I mean, that's the thing about movie theaters. You know, people think, well, I have a big screen at home. And I'm like, well, it's, it's not just about your screen or your sound. Yeah. It's about the environment. It's like going to a concert. Yeah. You know, you might listen, oh, exactly. to, you might mo- listen to a bootleg later and be like, that kind of sucked. But in the moment, <laughs> you got a couple beers and you're having a good time. You're like, this is the best time ever. Movies are like that when you go to the theater. Well, I think, like, both Harley Quinn and Bill and Ted benefit from that for sure. Yeah. I mean, comedies absolutely benefit. Comedies, horrors, Definitely. you know, when you have that, like, palpable... Yeah, you know atmosphere. Or like, <laughs> I love watching like I think I think when I went to go see the new Hall- uh, the new Halloween, mm-hmm. you get moments where everyone's either laughing or kind of like yeah. you, you hear the rumbling, and then all of a sudden there's like five minutes of just like nothing because everyone is just like Shh, you know what's funny what's I happen? saw that at the drive-in as well. Wow, because I thought it was a drive-in movie. Yeah, yeah I was like, I'm gonna go see Halloween at the drive-in, and it had a palpable atmosphere, yeah. and like it was cool because you would hear, like, the ripplings of screams and all these cars, and, like, it was cool. Or the laughs. Like you mentioned, there's yeah. a lot of laughs in that movie, and, you know, you don't get that in every movie. No, But there's no. certain ones that are, like, it's peak movie theater. Speaking of movies that need to be seen in the theater, Nolan. Yeah. So you saw Tenet. I saw Tenet twice. I sadly twice. have not seen it. I've seen Tenet twice, yeah. too. Yeah, but you but saw But on, on, on a 70 inch screen. Yeah. It's freaking phenomenal in 4K, and the you know sound is great, but... Seeing that on a big screen, I think, is a different experience. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I can't imagine seeing Interstellar for the first time at home, yeah. not having seen that uh, uh, in the movie theater. Yeah. So, Tenet, uh, sadly, was my first Nolan that I had to experience at home first. You know, you're of the uh, mind, like, you got a young kid, which I do, too, so I'm, I'm just an a-hole, I guess. <laughs> but, I never, you know, I never said it, but, <laughs> but you're right. You know, obviously, being safe is not a bad thing. Like, right, yeah. I'm all about being safe. Like even though I go do stuff, I'm wearing a mask. I'm I'm keeping away from people. I'm I'm picking and choosing what I do do as far as how they're handling things. Right. But if Alamo hadn't handled things well, I wouldn't have gone back. Right. I will say that. Did you went to Harkins once? Right. I went to Harkins once. And you were like, eh, no, 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 I'm not going I, back. I didn't go back. And, and well, here's the thing. I wanted to see Tenant on IMAX. For okay, my that's what that's what it was. Okay. And from what I understand, they have since then because this was early on. Perkins has evolved how they're doing things. At the time, they were trying, but there was a couple things that would slip through the cracks. Sure. Like, just to give a for instance, this and I think this has changed. So in Alamo, if I buy two tickets, it automatically blocks out seats. Oh, So yeah, you yeah. know that you're automatically not going to have anybody around you for the seats you bought. Where Harkins was, they just had gone in and marked off every two seats. Two seats open, two seats taped off, literally. Yeah. So if I bought a ticket by myself... And then I bought a ticket, I could get... You could look in there and be like, oh, there's an empty seat. And you could get it, and all of a sudden you're randomly sitting next to somebody. I believe it changed that since then, because I'm not the only one who complained. But I moved, because I was like, I'm not going to... You know, here's the thing. Like I said, you know, you can call it paranoia or whatever. I'm I'm still going to be safe. Right. So I moved. No, and coming Um, from, again, a central worker... Yeah. um, Yeah, you're you're, in the the trenches. The time when we started this... And the policies that we enacted to where we are now are completely different. Okay. There was yeah. a point there where it was daily. We we're like, okay, you know what? Don't do that one anymore. Let's yeah, do this. Let's do this. Changed. Let's do this like, thing now. Yeah, it's you know, been don't. An you know, don't. Okay, stop wiping that down. Let's wipe this down now. Okay. Let's let's put up the plastic screen. Well, like, like at the beginning when people like here at least in Arizona, um, where we are, this lovely, uh, you know, very liberal state, very progressive. We're blue, um, we're blue now, apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, apparently. Yeah, we're very blue, except for, you know, everything else. At first, like, masks weren't necessary. No, like, like, yeah. It, it, and here's the thing, that came from the top. Like, yeah. Fauci was like, ah, oh, I don't know if they really help, you know. And things have changed, obviously. So you've been going through that oh, yeah. on a daily and now basis. It's... All right, so, so yeah, but yeah, so I saw Tenet twice. So, Mrs., have you seen it since you've been at home yet? Yeah, so I, I watched it on, on the 4K. Okay. Yeah, so actually, I've seen it three times, I guess you would say. Yeah, you know. I still think it's got to be such a different movie for you. I'm curious to see if it makes your top ten. My first time watching it, I didn't know if I liked it or not. Yeah, like, I, I knew I enjoyed it, but I didn't know. Like, like there's no breathing room in that movie, no breathing room whatsoever. Yeah, for for how bloated people say it is, I feel like that usually means there's like a certain amount of chaff, and there's none. No, it's like, just very like. I do like that they throw you in. I love that when movies do that. Yeah, like, Miami Vice does that. Mike, Michael Manns. Yeah, actually, that's it throws you one into the, the middle. Of that movie. It throws you into the middle yeah. of the plot, yeah. and you kind of got to catch up. Yeah, I, I, I always love that. And Nolan movies are kind of known for that. Is like you're right into it at the beginning, basically. You're right, you, I guess Inception does he, kind of do the same thing. Those, he calls them prologues, you know. Oh no, those, those scenes. That, I don't, I don't see it on here. Oh, uh, yeah. what, what's Cap One or Capone? Oh, that's Capone, the movie with Tom Hardy. <laughs> Oh, is it? It's of course not in anyone's top ten. I just thought it'd be hilarious. Okay, because well, some of these like like Sky Cap and Mike Mank. 
Because Old Man's in Sky Cabin? No. No. Is Mank on your top ten? It's not. Okay, then let's talk about Mank real quick. Okay. Mank reminded me of Sky Captain. Because of the way it was shot? Just everything about it. There's a gloss and a phoniness to that movie okay. that reminded where me of every, Sky Where everything is CGI? Everything just felt like... I mean, did they all talk with that transcontinental <laughs> accent? Well, I mean, it just seemed really phony to me, that movie. I... Something about and, it. And man. I'm not saying I didn't like it or didn't... I'm not glad I watched it, yeah. but like... You know, it, it seemed like he was trying really hard, like, I really want it to sound like mono, and I'm going to put in cigarette burns, even though they're not really going to be in the right place a cigarette burn would be, and everything... So you wanted to go back to Fight Club? <laughs> There's cigarette burns in Mank. That's weird, man. Yeah. Um, who else does... Soderbergh does stuff like that, right? Man, you know, I love Fincher. Or I, actually, I don't know if I love Fincher. I like Fincher a lot. When, when he hits, man, he hits. But... I'll say that. Mink was one of those like, man, I feel like this is gonna be brutal to watch. It was, or at least like, like it would feel like a chore. It was kind of boring. Yeah, like, and know? I, I love Oldman too. Yeah, Oldman I love, and, and, and like, I don't have an Orson fetish. Like, oh, yeah, we talked about this. Yeah, yeah, you know, no, no. I, yeah, I like a lot of his movies, and I absolutely appreciate his impact on cinema. But like, when I think of my favorite old directors, to be fair, he's not the first one I think of. No, and I mean. You're a little bit younger than me, but I think both of us are slightly out of the range of people in love with Susan Cain. Yeah, I think our generation... I think if, like, if maybe if we, we went to school in the 80s, yeah. he might have been more of our guy. Yeah. But I think we're a li little too far, because I think both of us probably lean toward the 70s and 60s. Absolutely. I think the 70s for us is, you know, obviously, you know, our generation growing up on Spielberg and Lucas and, like, those new Hollywood guys, we obviously gravitate more towards that. Um... But yeah, like Orson maybe just didn't cross over as well as like yeah. Hitchcock crosses over. Real yeah. old our generation. And then you know I go pretentious and I'm like, oh man, I love Renoir. And like, the first Bisconti, time I like, watched a La Grande Illusion, I blew me away. Yeah, you know? or, or freaking uh, uh, Luis Buñuel, I think yeah. is amazing, and doing cool shit. Of course, this this is what Vinci goes off on. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're gonna go on Tarkovsky next. So I've only I, I was we were talking about this at work actually the other day. Surprisingly, I've only seen Solaris and Stalker. Okay. <laughs> as I just as I just named directors off your criteria shelf. <laughs> well, yeah. Let's, let's talk about uh, Bergman, Bergman next. Was, but, but yeah, like but I like these guys and like I'll watch them anytime. Yeah, and, like Hitchcock. I, I I go through my phases where I just watch nothing but Hitchcock. Oh yeah. Or like Hawks. Yeah. Every genre Hawk. Hawks touch, he made a masterpiece oh, yeah. of, you know. Just watched uh, Bringing Up Baby yeah, like, and um, His Girl Friday I mean, within the past that, six months. For, to be able to do His Girl Friday and then be able to do Rio Bravo. Oh, yeah. Or, this is Capone. The, is the actual Al Pacino one, the good one, Scarface. Oh, okay. Yeah, Scar Okay. Yeah. I thought you meant because uh, Pharaoh, uh, was it Land of the Pharaohs, he made, and it was like it cost too much money and like nobody liked it. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Scarface is great. The original Scarface, oh, yeah. not, not Pacino Scarface. No, which we, I, I think we bonded because we both disliked that one quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Whereas we, we every were... fucker in college has this, this stupid poster up. Yeah, yeah. Because that was, that was another thing with our generation. Like, the people prior to us didn't like Scarface. Oh, really? Yeah, Scarface wasn't well received when it came out. Oh, good. And then, like, you know, 20 years on, when we're in, like, film school and stuff, people are like, oh, it's the best gangster movie yeah. of all time. And yeah, I was you like... Get, uh, you got that movie poster, you got a Fight Club poster, yeah, yeah. maybe a Taxi Driver. We, we gotta get a cool Tarantino people. in there. That, that he was oh, fetishized in, oh, yeah. in, in my film school, at least. And you gotta, like, um, hate Jackie Brown. Yeah, yeah, that was like, he's great until Jackie Brown, and then Kill Bills were coming out at that time, so it's like, God's back. <laughs> God, he's... Jesus is coming from the water. So it looks like your number 10 is The Invisible Man. <laughs> um, for me, though, my number 10 is Brandon Cronenberg's Possessor. Okay, which I haven't watched yet. Fool is absolutely channeling his dad's early stuff. Okay. Uh, it's lots of body horror. It's very gory in, in the best way. And this is a... I think this is a step up from... I think his first movie is called Antiviral. This one is... There's like... This new technology where you can like implant your conscience into another person and then kill someone and then so it's now that that person's like gets charged with murder. Mm -hmm. Super super interesting concept. He does some cool stuff with it. Very cool stuff with mirrors because why not? It's, yeah. it's different identity. Did you see Underwater? I did not. I, I missed the time when studios made like survival horror, right? You know, creature features. Well, Speaking of bottle movies, it's that old school like The Abyss or Leviathan. They're underwater. What, what, what in did, a uh, was it Blake Lively? 
a couple years ago did the one where she's on the rock. Oh, um, The Shallows. Yeah. Which, I mean, you're not going to have to pull me very hard to be like, hey, we're going to go watch Blake Lively get terrorized by a shark. She'll be in a bikini for the entire time. And was it, isn't I'm that like, down. It's, it's, on a, it's well done. Yeah. Like, it, it gets a little CGI-y in the last, like, few minutes, but, I mean, that's kind of expected, but I but, mean... But, like, I like that. Um, I want to watch Underwater. I don't hate Bella. Yeah, no, she, or, she's... Or Rob Hat. You know, she's one of those weird ones that sometimes she'll be in a role and you're like, man, she just have a personality and then sometimes you'll see her and you're like, okay, yeah. like, she can act. You as a sci-fi fan I think would like it because... It's, it's, a, it's a creature feature, right? It's a creature feature and there's some hardcore Lovecraftian stuff in there. Yeah, which I am constantly on the outlook for. Like, there's not... There's no... There's not a whole lot of Lovecraft stuff that's good so much as there's stuff that's inspired by Lovecraft that's good. This is like even beyond inspired by. Like nice. It's like in it. Cool. If I'm it excited. makes sense. And I'm actually watch that tonight. TJ Miller, you know, <laughs> he's a douchebag in it, which means he's not really acting. Right. And it's always fun to watch him get killed. I rewatched the Cloverfield trilogy over is, is over it a pandemic. Trilogy? Well, whatever. I rewatched I re point is I rewatched Cloverfield. Totally forgot he's the fucker behind the camera. Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> more like Cleverfield, JJ. Yeah, the um, boy doesn't have school tomorrow, so I mean we're uh, gonna stay up late and watch Clockwork Orange. Well, you know, there's there's that too. I'm not saying underwater's as good as Clockwork Orange. But but, it, but mean, you're saying it might be. I mean, listen, you know, underwater has, you know, dry for wet underwater sequences. What is what does Clockwork have? Dry for wet. Shots of them walking by water. Okay, Kubrick. <laughs> yeah. Good job, buddy. Yeah. Was this your uh, Expendables for the year? I remember you 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 very famously put the Expendables and Expendables two in your top ten. Absolutely, I thought I probably put Expendables three in my top ten. I think as we well. were defunct by then. Yeah, where else are you going to get Chuck Norris doing a Chuck Norris joke? Uh, for those of you who are just listening to the podcast part, this is where I'm going to chime in with you guys should absolutely go see Hawk Schlock's YouTube series. <laughs> you have a five minute conversation about why. You what is it? You own the Adamson set, or no? You or you've seen his movies way more than you've seen Citizen Kane, yeah. which this this yeah. apparently podcast is all about bashing Orson Welles. <laughs> yeah, screw Orson Welles. But I, I'm fighting with myself a lot about the use of bad movies, the mm -hmm. more bad movies. Yeah, I hate that. I, I to be honest, I hate it. That's um, why I use the word schlock, right? Because schlock can mean a lot of different things. Exactly. The quote I come back to, and I I don't know if you watched my Three Thousand Miles to Graceland. I did not yeah, watch that one because I don't care about that movie. Okay. Well, you should watch it. Well, you can watch the first two minutes because I think that's when I mention it. I either listened to or I read an interview with the director. And he said, all movies that get made deserve respect. Even bad ones because it takes just as much effort to make a bad movie as a good movie. For sure. And, and I assume those of you out here actually listening or watching have tried to make student films. I know I have. Yeah. And I've never gotten longer than seven minutes. You made a feature. Yeah, I made a couple. You've made one feature that I have on Blu-ray. Yeah, yeah, it's true, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's comprehensible, and, like, you can just tell, like, just the seven minutes that I've made, like, holy shit, like... It's a lot this, of work. This must have taken you an excessive amount of time. So I get that quote. You don't like bad things. Mm -hmm. You might like something that is objectively bad... But to you, it's not. I argue with a friend all the time because his whole thing is, well, art is... A, he, he has his definition of what art is. And I'm like, but that's a subjective opinion. Yeah. He doesn't like the Avengers movies. That's which great. Which I totally get. Yeah, I, I you don't love those. I don't love them. I, ha I own them, you know. Yeah. I, but some I like more than others, you know. But, like, I'm like... Because he's like, well, you know, it's not Star Wars. It's not, you know, the Beatles or Michael well, Jackson. I'm like... As much as I love Star Wars, come on, man. I'm, not, I'm like, listen, The Avengers is more or less just a continuation of the fast food restaurant industry that is Star Wars. Yeah. You know, that's... Let's call it what it is. We, Me and you have, we have talked about this a lot of, like, we both have started diving deep into, again, quote-unquote, shitty movies. Yeah. Well, because, I mean, with 2020, all that stuff started going down... I did not feel like watching an Ingmar Bergman box wow. set. That did not sound appeasing to me at that time in my life. Yeah, and like, my wallet is upset at you, but you showed me Vinegar Syndrome. Oh, good lord, dude. And they're releasing yeah. these obscure... Obs just... Let's say shoddily made sometimes. Some of those bad crap crazy stuff that you could yeah, have spend money it's on. It's very insane cinema. I have one that's about... I think it's about... Dr. Jekyll's grandson, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's the end of it. The rest of it is about him hurting women into his own women fight club. So all this to say, underwater, we should probably give it a chance. Probably give it a chance. Lover's Rock, which is Steve McQueen's small axe movie. This one was like 70 minutes. It's literally just about a party. Okay. It's like this party, and it's this like this um, 
kind of like Caribbean neighborhood in England, and it's this culture that I've never heard of really. Like okay. I didn't realize there was these like Jamaican Caribbean. Which influence. I love when movies do. That. I love when movies when you do see sides yeah. of stuff that we as loser Americans. Who yeah, like I didn't realize out. there was this like 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 culture of Jamaican immigrants in in Britain, uh. and it's this whole neighborhood of them. And I, you have to. It's it's funny. You have to turn on subtitles because they're the the vernacular. The, the, is that thick? Yeah, and the yeah. vernacular is like it's not even just English English. It's and then there's like all this slang, where you're like, oh, eggy bottom, and you're like, is what does that mean? Yeah, what does that mean? And it reminds me of remember when Brick came out? Yes. And and like the poster, like because I had to go see it at an art theater because obviously Ryan Johnson was nobody then. You're right. Some would argue he's nobody now if they're not uh, a not fan me. of Last Jedi. I know that's like your number two Star Wars film of all time, but <laughs> yes, we're not we're not here to discuss insanity. Um, but like they had the poster that had the slang. Do you remember that? Yeah, like, yeah. And, and like it was breaking down like what they were saying in the movie because there's a lot of slang in that movie. Yeah, and it's so another movie needed that. You, absolutely, you, absolutely. <laughs> another one I, I I enjoyed and I recently watched it is um, Palm Springs. Did you watch it? Yeah. So that one actually, so I kept on making. This didn't make my short list though. I liked that one a lot. Y- you know what? I don't know why I kept forgetting about this one. There, there's all these you know um, time loop movies, time loop episodes and shows. Blah blah blah. And I never knew the missing ingredient in all those. Was wrong? Huh? No. Andy was Samberg. opening it with Andy Samberg whacking it while his girlfriend goes through a suitcase. That's what yeah. Groundhog's Day is missing. It really is. You know, you don't see Bill Murray jerking this gherkin to, you know, Andy McDowell. Maybe we'll see that in the Criterion release. That's in the extended cut. I, again, don't hate Andy Samberg. No. He wasn't Andy Samberg to 11. No. Nah. Like, he, he worked within the parameters of what he was given, which is what needed to happen. I all love those movies, all you know, those movies work. The time loop movies work because the ultimate point of a time loop movie is, no matter how good of a day it is, you don't want to relive it over and over again because that's not how life works. Yeah. You know, you got to have the lows to appreciate the highs and vice versa. I also like the weird cave. Yeah, and how I, I, they, I like that how sci-fi they, how they aspect don't to it. Really explain how it works. Yeah, they. It's, just, it's a bit of a MacGuffin. Like, yeah. Also, another movie we're thrown into, I think he's at least lived this 100, like 100 days or a couple of years or whatever. Mm-hmm. He kind of mentions it at some yeah, point. Yeah, it sounds like he's been there a while. It's One Night in Miami from okay. Regina King. Yeah. Love this movie. This was higher, but then I kept watching stuff. And like I said, we want to talk about favorites. As much as I enjoyed One Night in Miami, my top five I had a blast with. Okay. Watching one Night in Miami probably would make my top five. This one would have easily just been a showcase for actors in yeah. another director's hands. Yeah. For her first movie, and then I forgot. I didn't realize she did so much TV. Yeah, yeah, she did a lot of TV. You don't really get to flex your directing chops in TV a whole lot. No, because you're you're you know it's you're kind, kind of, of like the showrunner and the producer yeah. really control. It's like working for that. George Lucas. At the end of the day, you're still you're still doing what George wants. But her boxing scenes, I I I was talking to someone, and they reminded me of Johnny Depp's um, back Jack Sparrow, where it's almost mm. like he never seen a pirate movie. Yeah. In his life. Yeah. It's almost like she's never seen a boxing movie. Yeah, which absolutely. I'm, and, then, and then she was like, well, I'm going to shoot the scene how I want to. So she's not trying to ape anyone. There, there's no reverence there? No. Does that make sense? Like, you know, when you watch Cinderella Man and you're like, well, Ron Howard, I, I get it that you really like Raging Bull, but yeah, you yeah, might have exactly. been able to come up with your own way of doing the boxing scenes. It's very charming. Um, she's not... She's... You can see the action very well. Yeah. It's, it's very it's very understandable. But there's this dialogue that's going on within these scenes yeah. that I haven't seen a whole lot. You see it every once in a while. Like, you know, Rocky has them talking to Well, I mean, Apollo people. Creed, the character, comes a lot from Ali. Yeah, And yeah. Ali did that stuff. He was very show buddy. I mean, that was... He understood the... You know, and then the, the movie talks about it, you know, where he talks about being a wrestling fan. He understood the idea of how to make money. How yeah, to yeah. people to come in. Whether they hate me or not, they're paying to see me, and that's the most important thing. But then you get into this room... And her camera stills moving around like you never feel trapped. Yeah. You never feel like uh, like you're just in the hotel room. Yeah, it always feels more expansive than that. And I think that really helps with what they're talking about and how important you know this is. They're essentially talking about you know uh, the civil rights movement and the, the role each of them play yeah. in being a powerful. It, it's an interesting black person thing because and what they can do. All you know, all four of those guys obviously very important in, in culture and history, and. They were important at that time already, but it's it's an interesting time because a this really happened. Yeah, you know we don't really know what all went on in that room. I mean Jim Brown's talked about it a little bit, but um, and b they were all different from that point on. Oh you yeah, know, either in the sense of they were dead within a year. Was it Sam Cooke died you know, a little yeah, bit later? He, yeah, he he died not that long after that. You know, Malcolm X died not that long after that. You know, Jim Brown left football. I think I think he played two more seasons and then he left football for good. He's in Dirty Dozen, right? That's him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's in um, 
Um, I don't know if you ever saw the... I, you could kind of call it a spaghetti western, but I think it was actually made in America, but it's totally aping Leone. It's called 100 Rifles. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, and I, I think it's Raquel Welch and him and... Uh, who else is in that? But maybe... It, it might be the bandits in that. I think I think Bert might be in that. Nice. That seems about right yeah. for that time. So, there's, um, there's a scene on the roof where... Which, that, that's another thing, is they, they use that location. Like, it's yeah. not just in the hotel room. Well, that's, like, super know. smart. Like, yeah. But they're on the roof, there's an argument, and then I think they're about to go to blows or it looks like someone's about to fight mm -hmm. and Lance Reddick comes in. Yeah. And I just remember being like, yo, I don't care how big you are, I would not fuck with Lance Reddick. <laughs> it's like Van Damme coming in there. You know what's going to happen. Dude, Roundhouse he... kick to the face. Lance Reddick is just a scary motherfucker. <laughs> Whether it's the dude from Lost who goes to like recruit you. That's what it is. It's Lost for you. It always, <laughs> goes, it always goes back to Lost. Just trying to bring it in. Yeah, yeah. Also, if you want to listen more about Lost, go to www.dropthedice.com for a whole recap of every episode. Uh, but they, that's they, they, you mean Lost doesn't have a board game, or they it probably does do. Have, it does have a board game. It supposedly sucks. I really okay. need to find it and play it yeah. just for fun. So you can do a review on it and talk about Lost some more. Exactly. I love bottle movies, but this one, it didn't really feel like a bottle movie. No. Is Freaky in your top five? No. You want to talk about yeah, Freaky? Let's talk about Freaky. Just so Freaky is on my short list, though. So it, it ends up landing at thirteen. I just after all these years, you know, comedies, serious, you know, trying all these different things, we found the niche for both Jack Black and Vince Vaughn, which is playing teenage girls. There needs to be a <laughs> oh, crossover that with is, Jumanji. That is pretty funny. The freaky Jumanji crossover would be huge. That might be the uh, the, the revelation of this podcast, is that both Jack Black and Vince Vaughn nail Wonderful teenage, the teenage girls. girls. No, but they, like, it's not even a joke, though. No, no, they, they nail it, right? Like, like, you guys out there might so think we're joking. So much of the enjoyment from those movies comes from them. And then I was so happy to see Vince Vaughn flexing again. Yeah. And not just being like frat boy. Yeah. No, he was he was having fun but yeah. like and like I I I love Smears. Mm-hmm. Unabashedly, still. Although it's, I wonder if it's super chauvinistic now if I go back and watch it. Or misogynistic, <laughs> Probably. misogynistic Probably. whatever I have it is. Blue Ribbon, I haven't watched whatever it, it is. But after that he has a string of just him being like a funny dude. And, and you know, don't get me wrong, like old school. Yeah, it was great. great. But, but here like while, you see like, 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 oh my god, like there's there's there was a talented actor once yeah, in there. Yeah. You know, like man, like Norman Bates got it. It reminded me of Scream. I, I was, I was in a lot of ways, yeah, because you know, it's, it's 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 reverent satire. It's exactly, not like it's not mean spirited. I think in the way I think if it's the same way. I think it's doing what cliches. Scream did in the nineties yeah. for horror. Is is yeah, I completely agree with you there. I think that this director is actually doing that with a lot of his movies. Yeah, he's taking typical stories, Freaky Friday in this case, obviously. Yeah, and then Happy Death seen, Day is freaking Groundhog yeah, Day. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of time loop movies, and you know. Twisting them into these, you know, horror movies that are, you know, kind of satires of the charming. genre, but also being like legit horror movies. Oh yeah, um, I think in the first ten minutes of Freaky, there's pretty gnarly death. Oh dude, there's several in that movie. I it's mean, funny because like when when Vince Vaughn kills someone, it's pretty brutal, and he's this giant dude. Yeah. But then when the girl starts doing it, you're also like, oh shit. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we've all had teachers that gave us a splitting headache, but nice. That was that so. had a lot of practical effects, which I'm going to get to more later on. Vast of Night, which is also on Amazon Prime. Okay. And it's literally, it's just these two high schoolers who run a radio show in their high school, and they hear this sound that that they find out is, like, coming from far, far away. And okay. it sounds like something they've never heard before. And the rest of the movie is them trying to essentially, so like... So it's contact in high school? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> so it's them trying to figure out where the sound's coming from. It's, I think it's set in the 50s. Yeah, set in the 50s. Okay. Super, super old school sci-fi vibe. Um, of course, you find out that it's aliens, or probably aliens, and you f they find other people in the town who are like, oh, wait, like, have you seen them yet? We've seen them, and it's just super cool, it's super fun. We were talking about B-movies earlier. Um, he's actually doing a good job. Oh, uh, sorry, Knight. Yeah. There's one shot that people on every podcast have talked about, which I'm not even going to bother here. Uh, I'm curious to see when you see it, and you see the shot, if you think it's actually that good. I kind of thought, like, oh, cool, you know how to use rails, but... So what about, um, what about Fat Man? Did you see Fat Man? I did not see Fat Man. I, I wanted to see this one. The trailer for this one, for those of you who scoff at the idea of Santa being hunted by an assassin, the trailer for this looks amazing. It, it um, I mean, my, my joke was, when, when I watched it, was I'm waiting for the, you know, the franchise, you know, Too Fat, Too Man, yeah. Fat Man, Gluten-Free Drift, Fate Man, but... Again, they both look like they're having a blast. Walton they're, Goggins they're looks like he's having so much fun. Ha oh, Walton Goggins, Mel Gibson, whatever you say about the dude, he's got screen presence like very few. Oh, like, yeah. He's got that magical screen presence that when he's there, you're watching him. 
And when he's not on screen, Goggins is picking up the load and he's running with it across the 50 yard line. God, I, I say stuff like, I wish that guy got more work. But he's in, a, he's in I think so much stuff. But it's just, he works I wish a lot. more people knew him. I think that's what, what it is. is. Like his two minutes in G.I. Joe is amazing. Oh, in G.I. Joe 2? Yeah, yeah. When he, he steals the movie in that one little scene. That, he's in the second Ant Man. Mm hmm. Yeah. And he's freaking awesome. Yeah. That. Like, that's one of my favorite parts of that movie. Exactly. That's... Yeah. He. He elevates whatever he's in. I was so happy when he was in Django, mm -hmm. and then Tarantino was and like, well, he, "Fuck this! Like, like, I need, I need, I need, him I, more, I, yeah. give me more Goggins." Yeah, yeah, give me more Goggins. So, Hateful Eight is is a Goggins show in a lot of ways. And like, I, I like pretentiously like in old school. Like, I fucking loved him in The Shield. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was great as was it Boyd Crowder. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, Justify because he was only supposed to be in that first episode of Justify. No, he was supposed to die. Oh, just like Poe Dameron. Yeah, yeah, just like just like Poe. Um, they were like, dude, his... They recognized it. Oh, yeah. He, him and Timothy Olyphant just had a magical chemistry together. That fucker, too. Yeah. Olyphant. Yeah. He was in Mandalorian, dude, and, and that's all I want to do. When he was standing there, like, in the doorway, in the armor, I was like, that looks like Olyphant. And also he speaks, I'm like, it is Olyphant. But it's funny, because, like, he is Olyphant, but it somehow fits still in Star it's, Wars. It fits. It fits. And, like, he's the only one who's just like, I ain't gonna fucking change who I am for no, this shit. No, I'm still gonna be Timothy. I'd it, watch a whole show of him as it, the sheriff. He even, like, he does this scene with his hand where he's like, you keep that armor. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, which, again, uh, those of you listening, I'm doing a pointy thing. Yeah. So uh, Fat Man, it takes its ridiculous idea very seriously. There's a lot of dark humor in it. Yeah. Like, if you found Killer Joe funny, you'll also find this funny. If you didn't find it funny, you'll probably be like, Hawk, Hawk, <laughs> what are you talking about? This is not funny. Yeah. Um, I laughed a lot. And, and I liked uh, the man who killed Bigfoot and Yeah, Hitler. yeah. And then, and then Hitler and then the Bigfoot. Yeah. That movie is not funny. It's not. It is it's not actually schlock. very melancholy I if not that, like, sad I, I went to that being like this yeah. is gonna be my you know this is gonna be my end game here at Hawk Shrek. yeah and then I was like well this is a serious story about getting old oh yeah you know and like 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 your value as you get old and yeah. like and once again you have a guy who you know you know when he's on screen Sam Elliott whenever he shows who up who just owns that movie dude yeah and then like I don't know how you share the scene with the, with the, with a the decent looking Bigfoot yeah. and you just for a five dollar budget he didn't look bad and Kajillion Air by Miranda July okay did you get around to this one? I didn't get around to that one. Man, I so I've seen Me and You and Everyone We Know. I forgot she did a movie called The Future, which I've never seen. I mm -hmm. uh, really like Me and You and Everyone We Know. She is quirky as all hell, man. This movie uh, somehow makes Evan Rachel Wood look kind of frumpy. Okay. that's It's hard to do, bro. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's Just her. Just ask Marilyn Manson. <laughs> oh, God. So it's her. She's the daughter in this family, and they're all con artists. And then they meet... Um, a young lady who loves Ocean's Eleven and wants to join in on the fun. Okay. And then their lives get turned upside down. And it's just, it's so charming. So it's Ocean's Eight, but better? It absolutely is. <laughs> Almost like a Hal Ashby, I think, sensi okay. I think sensibility to it. All right. That kind of like, it's kind of awkward, but not. Yeah. What's funny is how awkward it is. You know, speak of Hal Ashby in 2020, one of my favorite theatrical experiences from 2020 was getting to do a Q&A with the dude who produced all those ads. That's right. Yeah, you were saying that. Because he also he was a producer on, on Coppola's Dracula. Okay. And to, 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 you know, talk with that dude and talk about that history of, you know, him being this guy for these mega artists. Oh, it's crazy. I feel like you probably still hear Coppola's name. I don't... I feel like I don't hear a lot of young people talk about Ashby. Like, his movies aren't super pretentious. No. Like, like a lot of stuff that makes the Criterion is kind of like... Okay, I, I read the back cover now. I want to puke a little bit, <laughs> yeah. especially on Hawkshawk here. Yeah. But um, like Ashby's movies are, are you know, there there's a quirkiness to them. Yeah. And and there's that dark humor, that levity that's kind of always there. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't cast these average people in these roles. Like it would be. We were. I was talking about that with somebody recently. We were watching well, Pretty in Pink actually. Okay. And and she asked um, the question of would she be a star today. I mean, if you look, the Rachel Lee Cook started, and she like looked horrible with her mm -hmm. glasses on yeah, and, sure. and her overalls. It, it took Freddie Prince and, to, to, and to, to pull her out of that. That's the thing is, if you wear glasses, ladies, and you know baggy clothes, you're frumpy and you're ugly. But that movie is. was progressive because Freddie Prince was actually smart. Well, yeah, I tell you what's progressive for Freddie Prince is, and you know, he he took this movie career and turned it into a career as a writer for WWE. Wait, really? Years. Yes. Oh, I was gonna say he turned it into becoming a Jedi. No, 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 no. He, he spent years as a writer for WWE. Each his own. 
Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Okay. And I think yeah. this was done by... Th- this will be in my top five as well. Another th- um, theater play turned yeah, movie. Yeah. Again, movie. this one is a little bit more... This is definitely more... Localized. Felt more like a play, uh, even more it, so than... But again, the camera's doing some... In yeah. the very beginning, the camera's doing some cool stuff with tracking um, as, all, as all the flies around Chadwick as he dances around the room. And I love this because in the very first scene with him, he goes and buys shoes. Yeah. And Which, if you haven't seen the movie... They're fabulous. Know, well, well, they're, they're fabulous. And also, you know, spoiler alert, those might come into play later. Sure. The, uh, and just the whip-snap dialogue. Yeah. The fact that I love each of the older band members mm-hmm. and how they all have their own personality. They have their own stories. Their own per- they feel like lived-in characters. So much. You know. uh, and then you have freaking Viola swinging for the fences. Yeah. I would love to see because you know I'm a, I'm a music fan, and I would love to see a larger Ma Rainey story. Yeah, because she's very interesting, and I would love to see her play it. Oh it's yeah, it's not gonna happen. Obviously, that doesn't that's not the way film works. Yeah, but um, Chadwick he deserves an Oscar. Oh for sure, dead or you know whether he was living or dead. Yeah, he he's great in it. This I think he's better in this than Five Bloods. Yeah, I, I would say that. I mean, he obviously he has a little bit more to work with, you know, time wise, but. I mean, I don't have the reverence for Black Panther. A lot of people our age do. You know, sure. Like, you know, I, I like it. I own it. But like, I'm not like the biggest MCU guy. You know this. Yeah. Um, so it's not it's not me saying he deserves the Oscar because I'm like, oh, you know, Wakanda forever. You know, I'm saying he deserves the Oscar because going back to Justified, he's in an episode of that. that Is I'm, he really? Yeah, he's in one little episode. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, this guy's great. I love baseball. You know this. So I love yeah. 42. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, I feel like it's gotten a little bit more love in more recent years. Here, here's my thing with movies like this and The Five Bloods, and you know we talked a little bit earlier about One Night in Miami. Is everyone's always been, com- you know, like, hey, why isn't there more nominations for women? Why aren't there more nominations for blacks? Why isn't, you know, where is it? And my whole thing is like, well, make better movies and yeah. make a lot of them to where they can't shut you out. Basically, right. there's so many good movies this year that were made by women directors, oh yeah, black actors, so much so that Spike Lee's. Isn't getting the love it deserves because there's so many other. Yeah, you know, he's I maybe know. our most well-known black director. Oh, yeah, easily. And he's being more or less getting shut up because there's so many good ones this year. But by the end, we have this weird culturally appropriation moment. Yeah, because that's happened a million times in music. I mean, I know Marty started it all. Well, I mean, God, you just have to look at Marty uh, McFly. You know, what is it? Uh, all along the Watchtower, and then Bow Star Galactica there, there you just go. takes it there you and, go. and makes Dylan it. Dylan stole that from space. Yeah. Synchronic 2001. Why yeah. did you call it 2001? Synchronic 2001. Oh, Dr. got Dre. it. Dr. Dre. Not in 2001. I just watched 2001 with the boy. Okay. So I was like... Oh, you're, I, you're, I, I, I don't really get where he's going with that. Yeah. I was. Um, I literally, like, the whole time you were taking care of the girl. For, for, I was like, for, for, like, for kids, that's a... It's a it's a hip-hop joke. It is a hip-hop for, joke. Uh, for an album that came out... In 2001. Well, it actually came out in 99. Did it really? Yeah. It was so ahead of its time. So this is uh, Benson and Moorhead who've given us uh, Resolution and Spring and Endless. This is the newest film. Have you seen Resolution? I mean, I'm That's the one where I've seen. Resolution I, I is saw... one where they're in the cabin and one of them is an alcoholic. I did see that one. With Hawk Schlock. We what? like real demons and, yeah. and, and metaphors. Guys and have gotten better with each film. Yeah. I think that they show progression. I think they show either things that they've learned I mean that's what you want right like yeah you know what, yeah like what, come on Zach Braff you, what kind of loser hits their high mark at 24 years old and never hits it again nice. only Orson Welles <laughs> would do that you know yeah and then what did he do after that F is for fake no fuck that come on yeah <laughs> It's kind of the dream, right? They're being rewarded yeah, for learning you, and doing good work. That's what you want, right? You want to go potential. from memento to, before you know it, you get to do Tenet and do whatever you want, right? And, like, arguably, he's got that ticket now forever. As long as I don't have, like, five huge bombs in a row. Right. Like, that happened to Shyamalan. Oh, Shyamalan, yeah, yeah. Shyamalan, Shyamalan yeah, he, had his ticket punched. Yeah. And then he punched himself out. Oh, man. I like movies, you know, because a lot of my short films that I made were about maybe reality's not real. Maybe, you know, time isn't what we think it is. Sure. Things, those things always interest me. So a movie like this would obviously interest me. Uh, so real quick, the movie is about two guys. You have um, uh, Christian Grey and the Falcon, who are paramedics. and um, This is after the Avengers break up. Yeah, Falcon. and Christian Grey is kind of in a loveless marriage. Yeah. He, <laughs> The one weird part he, he, for me... He needs to spice up his So the one weird life. part for me, though, is he has, like, a baby, and then this 
older, yeah, the older daughter who's in college? Yeah, he's like, don't have kids 18 years apart. And I'm like... Does he say that in the film? Yeah, okay, maybe that I might miss that. Either way. And, so, and the girl who's 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 18 is, is kind of rebellious and falls in... And she ends up trying this drug that Mackie and Dornan have been kind of finding along as as this drug that kills a bunch of people. I think these characters aren't people in, in, in a horror film or a sci-fi no, film. No, no. These are, these are guys out of, like, a Punisher Scorsese film. It's some sort of, like, drama, like... It actually reminded me of, like, True Detective Season 1 a lot. Oh, I, yeah, I could and, see that. And this was kind of like if McConaughey's character did a lot of psychotropic time-bending drugs. Which but arguably like the, he did. But the music... The you know the cutting to the space and the stars as kind of transitional moments and stuff all kind of reminded me of True Detective, the vibe yeah. of them going from like scene to crime scene to crime scene, yeah. kind of this dark life that they. And live. I love how like at first, I mean, they're peeling back the layers as you watch it, and there's one crime scene where a guy's like stabbed, and they're like, ah, "What the fuck stabbed him?" And then they <laughs> open this <laughs> door, knife. and it's this giant blade. Was... So basically, they, what happens is they take this drug that takes them to different movies. It totally does, so, yeah. You know, at you know, at one point, you know, Falcon goes to Southern Comfort. You know, <laughs> nice. from, yeah. From, from at one point, Hill. he goes to the New World. Yeah. At one point, he goes to New World and just yells or, at Malik. He goes to like the Wicker Man at some point. Yeah, he goes to M Night Shyamalan's The Village. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the one I'm thinking of. Um, he goes to the Gray with Liam Neeson. But there's that part where where Falcon starts taking the drug. So the so the drug basically lets you transport to a different point in time somehow. Don't that doesn't matter. And when he is doing the tests, it's like a, like a little twenty minute span. Yeah, yeah. It's very cool. It, it is cool because it's almost like that in itself is almost like could have been a film. Oh yeah, but whether it's budgetary or not, like they, you could have done that, but they wanted us to know how lonely Falcon really is, even though he's having like he has all this like loveless sex. Yeah. They wanted us to like feel Jamie's pain as like this basically guy who's got a great life, mm-hmm. but he hates it. Yeah. You know, or that, you know, like, they spend the time that for us to get to know the characters. Even the wife, she's got a great line where Falcon's there, and she just goes on, is like, oh, like, too bad Uncle Billy. Too bad he screwed all my friends. And now he's over here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then she just delivers it. So it's a clunky line. Yeah. And she just delivers it so well. Yeah, because here's the thing. There's nothing about the dialogue that I'm like, oh, the dialogue's great. It's not. No. But they make it work. Yeah, and, and I'm one. I, I think and the that, atmosphere. And I wonder if that's because now they can afford Falcon and Christian Grey. Even at the end, when he goes to the Patriot, like mm-hmm. it's a very engaging scene. Yeah. Um, like obviously, it's great when guys get bigger budgets and, and whatnot. But you being a fan of their work, do you feel like them getting wrapped up in the Marvel universe will keep them from from doing more stuff that they want to do, or do you think this is a way for them to bridge to maybe? I'm hoping they go Nolan's yeah. route. Yeah, they get locked in for a couple of years, but yeah, maybe we'll a see a things maybe we'll on. see a prestige. Yeah. Okay, so the next one talk about soul. So so soul, uh, we all have it. Um, nice. I like this one a lot more than onward. Okay, yeah, yeah. I like them both, but yeah, I like soul both more. You know, it, it it is a little bit more metaphysical. I I love the idea of a movie about being passionate about life. Mm-hmm. And then fighting um, your passion and but then almost having them go like no no it's even easier than that and like. Like it's not about you living for that passion. It's, it's just, it's just you enjoying yourself and like living. Yeah, like yeah. that. Because I am absolutely of the mindset that like I love my passions. I love film and this and this and this and you know my family and whatever. But then like no no, no maybe you just love living. Like yeah, that just blew my mind when um, the weird two dimensional character. He, well, I mean, you can get so wrapped up in a passion that like that's all you have. Yeah, and that you was know? that and, was kind of what the movie the, is, right? The great like, scene is it, when he talks to the. Um, the barbershop guy. And he's like, I love this. We usually just talk about jazz. Yeah. You know, or whatever. I can't remember the exact dialogue. But, you know, that is, is that to me is kind of like a key point. Because we all have our passions. Yeah. You know, if I only talk about film with people, I mean, I, I, I love hearing about other people's passions and what they're into. And, like, that's how we learn. And, and it yeah, does. Yeah. I love the antagonist. The little dude who's like, no, 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 I fucking count perfectly. <laughs> yeah, he's great. It's just this this movie just 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 hits everything for me. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like I could sit and talk about Pixar films forever. Yeah, I know you love Pixar. Obviously, I think this is the first one that had a Dylan song in it. So I mean, it gets uh, nice. It, it gets it gets. Which going. song is the Dylan song? Uh, the Dylan song is it's like the hippie ship. Oh, that's, okay. That's, uh, that's a Dylan song they're playing when they're like 
gliding along. It's is kinda, it too? You know, I, I feel like Coco, Inside Out, and this movie all kind of form a thematic trilogy. Okay. About life, death, yeah, what yeah. we are, what what we what we're made up of. And arguably, those are my three favorite from the from the recent from one the here. recent years. Yeah. Well, even like I think Toy Story Four fell a little short for me. You know, I should go into Psycho Gorman. Is, is that on your top five? Dude, it, I was hoping it would, it would be. be my one or two. Would it really? Okay. Oh, yeah, I love Sonic Gorman. So, the way I've explained it uh, is you know, imagine an R rated Power Rangers movie written by James Gunn and Fred Decker, and then directed by Hen and Lauder, who did stuff like Brain Damage. And yeah, Frank I and saw the, the trailer for this, and I was like, oh, it's, okay. It's such a blast. It looks awesome. Uh, the, there's tons of. It looks crack- like it's your number three, yet. <laughs> yeah, behind Capone, of course. Yeah. Um, tons of practical effects. So if you're into ooey gooey practical effects, this is your jam. Um, one of my favorite bits is the in credit song because it's a total throwback to like. Speaking of my daughter, she loves Ninja Turtles, the old one. Yeah. yeah. If you go back to like the 1990 Ninja Turtles or like Ghostbusters 2, that time when like there was an 80s, 90s hip hop song that yeah. just retold the plot yeah. as the end credit song, Psycho Gorman has it. Nice. It's a total throwback. But yeah, yeah, it's, it looked like a looked like a lot of fun. As someone who grew up on Power Rangers and Turtles and, and those kind of things, I had an absolute blast for that movie. And you saw this in theater. I saw it in theaters. The way God and Chris it's Nolan and, 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 and everyone intended, intended yeah. us to watch Psycho Gorman. Yeah. Uh, I think my number two would be Promising Young Woman. Which I know I said I was going to see it. I didn't get to see it. Oh man, yeah. it's really hoping you're going to yeah, see it. I didn't get to see it. I'm going to go see it in theaters because I didn't want to. Here's the thing: I didn't want to spend twenty dollars to rent it when it's going to be on Blu-ray in a month. Sure. So I'm like, I'm just going to buy the movie because I know I'm going to like it. Too many people have told me that it's good. Yeah. yeah. So this is Emerald Fennell directed it. Mm-hmm. Another female director who, outside of my number one, I mean, it's my number two. So <laughs> clearly, outside of my number one, outside two, of your favorite, it's your second favorite. You think? I yeah. think so. Yeah. Okay. It's more or less a rape revenge movie, right? But it's yes. More than that. It's yeah. So that's 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 the uh, what the the ten second pitch. Yeah. And she's getting revenge on these people who try to take junk girls home and have their way with them. I'm not gonna spoil what she does because the reveal of that is pretty cool. Um, but people keep talking about how they cast nice guys. So they cast Adam Brody. It's got Christopher Mintz Plass. It's got uh, the guy who played Piz in Veronica Mars. Okay, who, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, uh, for my money, gets his fucking comeuppance here because fuck you, Piz. Veronica Mars always belonged with Logan. <laughs> it's true. I agree with that. Acting is top notch all the way around. It's. I don't like calling it a revenge film because I think it's so much more than that. One of the things people said is that they don't think her revenge at the end is good enough. And I, my point. Every time is, that's the fucking point. It's like when people are like, I can't watch The Searchers because John Wayne's a racist in, 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 in that movie. And I'm like, yeah. well, that's that's kind of the point of the movie, guys. That's the point of the ending. So, yeah, one of, one of my friends was like, man, like I wanted her to get a better um, revenge. Yeah. I was like, no, 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 no. You, you, that's, that's what the movie's about. I think it's important, you know. Important, like, an, an important film, which yeah. means we're not going to be watching it here yeah. on... Oh, no, Hawks Lock. Hawks Lock. Um, all right, let's let's nail our number ones because I know it's about um, time to go. I would say I don't have to be my number one. Definitely a movie that would be in my top one or two would be Let Him Go. Okay. Which is a neo western with Costner and Diane Lane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this Paul, this Paul and Ma pretty... Kent are are you know back on the farm. I didn't even yeah, realize anyway. that it was Paul and Ma Kent. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a card carrying member of the Costner fan club. I have Waterworld. On Laserdisc, Blu-ray, 4K. You have water paraphernalia right over here. Actually, I got a poster. Yeah, don't I? Yeah, yeah. And with the the action figures next to it. I love Waterworld. I love Dance with the Wolves. I love Costner movies, man. I do think you Um, don't, on on the videos that I've seen, you don't uh, praise Prince of Thieves enough. There was a rich man from Nottingham who tried to cross the river. What a dope! <laughs> Tripped out of rope. With, it's got Christian Slater. It's got everything. Yeah, I talk about it a little bit in um, the 3,000 Miles because there's a reunion because Slater's in it and Costner's oh, in nice. it. Oh, yeah, nice. Okay. And I talk a little bit about it and a couple other things, but yeah, I love Prince of Thieves, dude. I'll have to do more with that. That's true. Um, so yeah, I love I love Costner. He's still a movie star to me. But what's Let Him Go about? I, this I know is very little about. This is, you know, I just mentioned The Searchers, actually, and kind of a similar... Obsession movie, okay. Where um, Costner and Diane Lane are grandparents. Tragedy happens. The girl that was married to their son uh, marries somebody else, and they go away, kind of by night, sort of a thing. They're gone, and Diane Lane, and especially Diane Lane and Kevin Costner, are like, what happened? You know, where did they go? Where is our grandkid? And so they go on a hunt to find the grandkid and. Obviously, bad stuff happens to many people. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an especially obsessive search for Diane Lane, who 
you know, is having a hard time letting go her son, who's, nice. who's no longer in the film at this point. Hence the title. It's not Kevin Reynolds, is it? No, no, it's not. It's not our old boy Kev. Okay. You know, he, he's. I don't know what Kevin. You know what? The last thing I saw from him, he did a movie called Risen, which is about Jesus comes back, but it's from the perspective of a Roman soldier who is hired to. Was that Joseph Fiennes in that one? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the last thing I saw from Kevin Reynolds, man. Costner and Diane Lane put on acting performances. Costner's found his niche in his old age, as far yeah, as being yeah. like his voice. He goes a little bit gruffer on in these recent years. Yeah. He kind of takes on these... that British accent. Watch Robin Hood. You're like, well, this guy's a Brit, obviously. Yeah. I didn't even know until years later he's American. I know. Go Aberdeen. He, he actually he uh, he was raised in Compton. No, like, he wasn't. Yes, he was. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but he tells a great story of like in kindergarten, like for show and tell, he he took like his dad's rifle. And he's, like, in Compton, like, dragging this giant rifle for kindergarten to uh, do show and tell. And he's like, I don't know why I'm still alive. So um, he's, like, he's kind of found his niche. And, and Diane Lane just reminds you that, like, man, she can act. Dude, yeah, yeah, Diane Lane's amazing. She's great. I used, uh, I mean, here's the thing about the Golden Globes this year. They have done what I failed to do for years, which is uh, Shaft's Diane Lane. <laughs> and nice. She should have got a nom. But. Okay, so my number one, uh, most likely... Um, at least at the moment, is the Five Bloods from Spike Lee. I think Spike's on a good run. I feel like the Trump presidency, for any negatives that you might have seen, um, have inspired Spike Lee a lot. He Because um, this feels like a companion piece to Black Klansman. Absolutely. Like, it picks up right... Like, literally, the way Black Klansman ends with, like, real news footage and all that kind of yeah, stuff... Yeah, this one starts Literally out. picks up right on that. But this one... What, something I really like about this one, though, is that it's not... As much as it is, about again, about, the, like, like, these these five black men who and, and their experiences and how mm -hmm. it has affected them it feels more global with Vietnam we always hear about our soldiers yeah you know all the stuff the drugs they got on or you, you know Agent Orange and all this stuff and you know getting spit yeah. on when they came back to America well we, we, we don't really talk too much about the effect of it on the actual country we were in at the time right you know? which seems very unlike Spike to me it is yeah just full disclosure like he's always been up and down for me he's yeah, got, yeah he's got masterpieces but yeah for every do the right thing, there's um old boy. Black Klansman was the first time in a long time I felt like, oh man, I really loved a Spike movie. Yeah, yeah, and like that's probably the first time like, since like Inside Man that I was like, I love that movie. Right, and I think Inside Man does that good thing of like it seems like a Spike Lee film as a heist film. Yeah, yeah, uh, this almost felt like three movies. Like, yeah, each yeah, it's almost its own movie. Like you have the first act, which is kind of like a without a paddle for adults kind of like hey let's yeah, go yeah. back to you know this mystery and and then you have with this weird war movie at the end. Yeah, yeah, like like a, almost like a last stand kind of thing. You, you get these flashbacks if you haven't seen it to them young, and there's no de aging. It's, right, but it's not them young. It's just them. It's just them. I, I love the the aspect ratio change to like actually yeah. shooting it in sixty mil for the old stuff. The only thing I didn't like, and it's not their fault. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the the helicopter that they had for post crash was different than the helicopter they were using for the shots. Oh, okay. And so then they had a CG over the real helicopter that they, for those shots, because they're like, wait, wait a minute, it doesn't match up. Right. So the CG of the flying and stuff isn't great. Yeah. You know, but like, I also understand that Spike's not working with a $200 million budget, so. The use of Marvin Gaye in this is great. Yeah. You Getting mentioned older Trump, and, and I'm by no means going to get into any of that here, but he has a MAGA hat on. Yeah, and, yeah. And my God... Does it make this character so fascinating? It does. That, you know, like, they do that shot, which kind of remind me of, you know, in Goodfellas when they have the uh, airline ticket and they block out the airline. Yeah. They, they do, and they show the footage from the, the MAGA rally or whatever. Yeah. And they, like, black out the face, but they point the arrow, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I love that, like, this guy is that damaged. Sure. He's looking for... An answer? He's looking for... Something. A friend? Yeah. <laughs> Even in, in um, reading some stuff about it, Delroy Lindo was very, very hesitant about just being on screen with his hat on, because mm -hmm. he happens it happens to not be his belief. Yeah. Um, it's called acting. I don't know if you know this, but uh, Arnold's also not a T-800. <laughs> right. Well, so Wonder Woman wasn't your... Wonder, Wonder Woman, Woman didn't slightly didn't make it, man. All right. Well, I, I'm uh, as much as As much as I love Mando, it as just... As much as you enjoy, you know, Wonder Woman... Using a magic vibrator rock to bring back her boyfriend. That and uh, I'm still not sure why. It was in the 80s. <laughs> Kristen Wiig yeah. became a cat. I've read Cheetah comics before, and it is not even close to any way that she becomes a cat in the comics. Well, I mean, to be fair, Catwoman doesn't exactly lick herself and you know get bit by cats, but I love Batman Returns, so <sighs> that's just Burton. But Rock arguably, Burton. like she doesn't become a cat. Well, I mean, 
Just... I, actually, I recorded a, a quick like five minute thing last night, um, talking about our favorite Batman. Mm-hmm. And at the end, I told the story that you always tell of when they were like, "How do you feel about Bale and Affleck, you know, taking the reins of Batman?" And Keaton's response was, "I'm from Batman." <laughs> Hawk shock. <laughs>